Hi guys, uh, welcome to another video on the sign of four. Today we're going to be looking at chapter 10, the end of the Islander. And before we do, let's just recap chapter 9. So in chapter 9, Holmes and Watson had come up against a break in the case. They were kind of stuck. They didn't know the location for the steamship, the Aurora, which is the ship that they believe that Jonathan Small and Tonga are going to try to use to escape. Holmes goes to the docks disguised as a seaman and he finds out some additional information, but he hasn't yet told Watson what the information is. We get more development of attitude towards police with the recurrence of Othelia Jones, although we start to see some sympathy towards Othelia Thelney Jones uh, as a police officer from Holmes. The chapter ends with Holmes returning, maintaining his disguise, tricking Thelney Jones, tricking Watson once more to prove that you know he is this master detective. Um, and the chapter itself ends with the three of them sat in Sherlock Holmes' house, enjoying some rich food, some wine, generally living it up. OK, now this chapter begins exactly where that drops off and we get a little bit of the meal and then we're going to go down to the Thames and have this big chase. So Holmes and Watson are going to be in a police ship. They're going to chase the Aurora down. We are going to finally see Tonga, this indigenous character. We're going to get a lot of information uh, around Victorian fear again particularly Victorian fear of the colonies and indigenous people from the colonies. And we're then going to see the capture of Jonathan Small. OK, so as before, I'll read it and then we'll discuss some of my annotation. But just before we do, you know, we have this, the end of the Islander. What does that tell us is going to happen in this chapter? Who is the Islander? Now, obviously, it's referring to Tonga. So from the outset, we know that Tonga is going to die. OK, so our meal was a merry one. Holmes could talk exceedingly well when he chose, and that night he did choose. He appeared to be in a state of nervous exultation. I have never known him so brilliant. He spoke on a quick succession of subjects, on miracle plays, on medieval pottery, on Stradivarius violins, on the Buddhism of Ceylon and of the warships of the future, handling each as though he had made a special study of it. His bright humour marked the reaction from his black depression of the preceding days. Athelny Jones proved to be a sociable soul in his hours of relaxation and faced his dinner with the air of a bon vivant. For myself, I felt elated at the thought that we were nearing the end of our task and I caught something of Holmes's gaiety. None of us alluded during dinner to the cause which had brought us together. When the cloth was cleared, Holmes glanced at his watch and filled up three glasses with port. One bumper said he, to the success of our little expedition. And now it is high time we were off. Have you a pistol, Watson? I have my old service revolver in my desk. You had best take it then. It is well to be prepared. I see that the cab is at the door. I ordered it for half past six. Right, we'll stop there. Just quickly deal with a few of these points. So once more, the meal, I believe is a reference to the patriarchy. You know, this is all men together. They are sat once more in their rich, luxurious room, eating their rich, luxurious food, plotting the downfall of Jonathan Small, a weaker, somewhat less influential man. Remember what I talked about in the last video? You know, patriarchy wasn't just something that was designed to subjugate women. Weaker, less influential men they were also victims of the patriarchy. OK, so Holmes could talk exceedingly well when he chose. Um, I've never known him so brilliant. All of this refers to Watson's bias. You know, it, it talks about Holmes being knowledgeable, but at the same time, you get the impression that Watson is very, very impressed with Holmes and his intelligence. Now, again, this all links to Holmes being a typical example of Victorian uh, men. You know, he is the objective, he's intelligent, he's knowledgeable, he knows lots of things about lots of things. All of this is what Victorian people would aspire to, particularly Victorians in the middle and upper classes. 
Let's just think about some of these. So Miracle Plays, Medieval Pottery, Stradivarius Violins, these are very expensive, very rare violins. The Buddhism of Ceylon, that links to, you know, colonialism, um, <clears throat> particularly, particularly Indian colonialism. Uh, and Warships of the Future, a little bit of foreshadowing for what is about to happen, you know, the chase that's going to happen with the ships. Uh, and, and then once more, we get a little bit of the impression that Holmes has this duality of character. The bright humour contrasting the black depression. This juxtaposing imagery talks about how the, there are two sides to Holmes's character. And we've seen this throughout the whole novel so far. You know, at the beginning of the novel, he's depressed because he doesn't have a case. He's depressed because he's using drugs. Then once the case happens, he becomes much more energetic. We get the break in the case. Holmes is this dark and gloomy figure once more. Now that he's got a lead, he is this bright, humorous person. So this is the duality, the duality of Sherlock Holmes. And then we see that Athelny Jones has become more friendly. He is sociable in his hours of relaxation. This idea faced his dinner with the air of a bon vivant. A bon vivant is someone who likes to live well is someone who has a very refined palate, has tastes that are of a richer nature. Again, though, <laughs> also links with the idea of greed, the, the idea that maybe Athony Jones has had so much to eat in his time, he has developed this very refined palate. Uh, Watson is now infected by Holmes's enthusiasm. I caught something of Holmes's gaiety, you know, making it as a metaphor. Um, and this. So when they set off, they've been eating and drinking lots of wine all night. And as they leave, Holmes pours them three more drinks. So this shows us that drinking on the job wasn't seen as a bad thing, particularly for upper class people. Now, I haven't gone into this too much, but there are references across this novel about working class people drinking. You know, the, the tawdry brilliance of the public houses from the chapter where they go to see Athelney Jones. The observing the dock workers <clears throat> leaving the pubs with their morning wet. When we get to see um, Mordecai Smith, we'll see that he has been plied with alcohol by Jonathan Small. This sets up uh, a very strict dichotomy, you know, this, this opposing of ideas that the working classes, when drinking, are not to be trusted. They are loutish and slovenly and lazy and drunkards. But when the middle and upper classes drink, it's not, it's not a problem. It's fine. You know, Holmes and Watson drink a lot through this book, but that's not an issue because they are middle and upper class. The same when it comes to drugs, you know. Holmes, it's fine for Holmes to take cocaine and heroin because he is a middle upper class man who knows how to control himself. Not like one of these working class people who would just become infatuated and addicted and would squander their lives away. You know, they're, they're, again, a very clear duality, a very clear dichotomy between these two positions. Once more, they're prepared for violence. Have you a pistol, Watson? Yeah. Uh, his service revolver, this is a, a reference to his military past. This is a reference to the time that he spent serving in Afghanistan. Okay, so I'm going to start down here. So it's a little past seven before we reached the Westminster Wharf and found our launch awaiting us. Ah, I'm sorry about that. Holmes eyed it critically. Is there anything to mark it as a police boat? Yes, that green lamp at the side. Then take it off. The small change was made. We stepped on board and the ropes were cast off. Jones, Holmes and I sat in the stern. There was one man at the rudder, one to tend the engines and two burly police inspectors forward. Where to? asked Jones. To the tower. Tell them to stop at opposite Jacobson's yard. Our craft was evidently a very fast one. We shot past the long lines of loaded barges as though they were stationary. Holmes smiled with satisfaction as we overhauled a river steamer and left her behind us. We ought to be able to catch anything on the river, he said. Well, hardly that, but there are not many launches to beat us. We shall have to catch the Aurora, and she has a name for being a clipper. I will tell you how the land lies, Watson. You recollect how annoyed I was at being balked by so small a thing? Yes. Well, I gave my mind a thorough rest by plunging into a chemical analysis. 
One of our greatest statesmen has said that a change of work is the best rest. So it is. When I had succeeded in dissolving the hydrocarbon which I was at work at, I came back to our problem of the Sholtos and thought the whole matter out again. My boys had been up the river and down the river without result. The launch was not at any landing stage or wharf, nor had it returned. I'll stop there. So let's, let's just, again, go through the page, go through the annotations. So we start with Holmes eyed it critically. This shows that Holmes is focusing on every single detail. And this, again, is a difference between Holmes and the police. Because the police, they don't understand how to work undercover. They've left their police light on the boat. However, however, Holmes manages to convince them to take it off. And then the small change was made. This links with this quotation from chapter one, an extraordinary genius for minutiae, that Holmes is able to spot the tiniest detail and correct it. And he's able to think about all the different vectors and all the different factors when it comes to being undercover. However, the police do not. Um, so this reference to two burly police inspectors, so they are the muscle, they aren't there to think, they aren't there to do, they're literally there to just detain people when needs be. Once more, Holmes is the thinking, the police are the muscle. Uh, now a little reference here to the Tower. This references the Tower of London. Now hopefully you will understand that the Tower of London has a history of detaining criminals. It's where executions used to happen back in the olden, olden times, sort of pre-Victorian. So this going to the Tower foreshadows arrest and crime in general. You know, it foreshadows that a character might be executed, a character is going to be arrested. The Tower of London. Here we have a, a little bit of, of irony. We shot past the long lines of loaded barges. You know, this being a metaphor, this foreshadows killing and foreshadows the killing of a character. You know, it's only a small detail, <clears throat> but by Conan Doyle putting these kind of words in, he lays the groundwork, he lays the groundwork for events that are going to happen later on. Uh, Holmes is satisfied with the, the speed of the ship. And this, I will tell you how the land lies, Watson. So how the land lies is an idiom to mean what is going on, what the situation is. If I talked about how the land lies now, I'd say we're all on quarantine, we're all on lockdown, school might be reopening on the 1st of June. We just don't know. That is the how the land lies. Uh, and, and this shows that Watson, sorry, that Holmes is now going to give Watson details of the case that Watson previously missed. Now this, this is the Victorian way. Um, I've alluded to this before, this idea that a change is as good as a rest and that there was a very strong Victorian mentality to that. You know, if you are tired with a job, rather than being lazy and stopping work altogether, just change the work that you're doing because a change is as good as a rest. And this is what Holmes is saying here. Um, Holmes has become thoroughly sick of the case. He's stuck on the case. It's driving him wild. Rather than resting, he moves on to doing some chemistry, as we saw in the previous chapter. And he even references that a change of work is the best rest. Now, this is a Victorian adage. Uh, an adage is a saying. It's also a didactic saying. Now, didactics, if you were to teach didactically that is that you are finding meaning in sayings any of you that may have done Alice in Wonderland will have come across this with the Duchess the Duchess is a character who likes to find meaning in sayings uh, and here we have Holmes attempting to find meaning in the saying a change of work is the best rest um, and it was originally something that was in a, in a magazine I, I've, I've looked this up and I can't find the exact author of that idiom, uh, sorry, of that adage, but but it definitely, it, it appeared in a magazine before this novel was written. So this is Conan Doyle taking something from Victorian society and putting it into his novel. If you get a question on Holmes, that's a really, really good thing to get into, if it's not on this extract. If you get something about Holmes from the beginning of the novel, 
here we have a quotation from Holmes from the very end of the novel, which I think sums up his character really, really well. He just wants to keep working and working and working and working. He never wants to stop. He believes a change is as good as a rest. Uh, my boys, just to, to comment, this is a little ownership of the underclass. You know, he, he believes the Baker Street Irregulars belong to him. All that kind of stuff. Let's move on. So I'm going to start here. Yet it could hardly have been scuttled to hide their traces. Uh, talk about the boat now. Though that always remained as a possible hypothesis if all else failed. I knew this man Small had a certain degree of low cunning, but I did not think him capable of anything in the nature of delicate finesse. That is usually a product of higher education. I then reflected that since he had certainly been in London some time, as we had evidence that he had maintained a continual watch over Pondicherry Lodge, he could hardly leave at a moment's notice, but would need some little time, if it were only a day, to arrange his affairs. That was the balance of probability, at any rate. It seems to me to be a little weak said I. It is more probable that he had arranged his affairs before ever he set out upon this expedition. No, I hardly think so. This lair of his would be too valuable a retreat, in case of need for him to give it up until he was sure that he could do without it. But a second consideration struck me. Jonathan Small must have felt that the peculiar appearance of his companion, however much he may have top-coated him, would give rise to gossip and possibly be associated with this Norwood tragedy. He was quite sharp enough to see that they had started from their headquarters in, under cover of darkness, and he would wish to get back before it was broad light. Now, it was past three o'clock, according to Mrs Smith, when they got the boat. It would be quite bright, and people would be about in an hour or so. Therefore, I argued that they did not go very far. They paid Smith well to hold his tongue, reserved his launch for the final escape, and hurried to their lodgings with the treasure box. In a couple of nights, when they had time to see what view the papers took, and whether there was any suspicion, they oh, sorry, hang on a second, they would make their way under cover of darkness to some ship at Gravesend or in the Downs, where no doubt they had already arranged for passages to America or the colonies. Okay, so... so here Holmes is talking about his view of Jonathan Small as a character. We get to see what his expectations of him are. Um, personally, I think that Sherlock Holmes underestimates Jonathan Small because of his class, and we're going to see that right now. So he says that he did not think him capable of anything. Hang on a second, sorry, I'll go back a second. He knew this man Small had a certain degree of low cunning. Holmes feels that he's analysed Jonathan Small's character and he believes that Small is capable of some basic cleverness. Low cunning, you know, cunning is to be sly or sneaky or stealthy. Low cunning is that you can behave in this way in a very simple fashion. You know, like creeping around a house is, would be considered low cunning. Stealing somebody's identity, that would be high cunning. So the idea that Jonathan Small is capable of that. However, Holmes underestimates Small because he didn't think him capable of anything in the nature of delicate finesse. So he didn't believe that Jonathan Small would have a very um, well thought out plan or that he would have planned for various circumstances. You know, in the way that we see that Jonathan Small actually has when we get to Jonathan Small's confession. I think this is Holmes very much underestimating Small. You know, he's a guy who's come from the Andaman Islands all the way to London to exact his revenge. He's had over a decade to think about his revenge and to plan it all in his mind. So why wouldn't he have any delicate finesse? Well, here we have Sherlock Holmes' reasoning for it. He says that that is usually a product of higher education. The idea that only people that are educated to a high level are capable of planning and cunning and all of these things. This shows that Sherlock Holmes believes that class holds Jonathan Small back. The fact that he isn't educated holds him back. And if you remember back to when Sherlock Holmes is giving his very first description of Jonathan Small, the very first thing that he references is he's a man of limited education. You know, Jonathan Small has not received much education even before what he looks like, even before his agenda and motive, 
The first thing, education. And education is intrinsically linked with class, particularly in the Victorian era. Please remember that lower class children would not be going to school, they would be going to work. Okay. So Holmes has worked it all out through probability, you know, he says that was the balance of probability at any rate, all that kind of stuff. However, Watson, it should say there, not Holmes, Watson has doubts. It seems to me to be a little weak. However, instantly Holmes dismisses it. No, I hardly think so. And again, you know, this is a, a bit of the difference between Holmes and Watson. Okay? They use the word lair. Holmes uses the word lair to talk about where Jonathan Small is staying. You know, this is an archetypal villain piece of imagery. When you think of baddies, they live in their lairs. But at the same time, it links to the idea that he is like vermin. And there are other words that Holmes uses to describe Jonathan Small as vermin uh, and Tonga as vermin. You know, when he talks about them swarming up the rope, you know, vermin swarm, bugs swarm, rats swarm. That comparison, that, that metaphorical comparison, I think really shows Holmes's opinion of Jonathan Small and Tonga. Okay. Um, however, we get the idea that Tonga, so, sorry, so, so Holmes works out that they're in hiding because Tonga would reveal Jonathan Small, because it is such a strange occurrence. Uh, quite sharp enough to see that, nice little metaphor there. This shows that Jonathan Small has some sense. You know, maybe we are getting the introduction of the duality of Jonathan Small's character. We'll cover that more. Um, and then cover of darkness, so a little bit of light, dark imagery because he wished to get back before it was broad light. This idea that Jonathan Small is hiding within the darkness. Holmes is the bringer of light. Jonathan Small is hiding in darkness. Again, that's contrasting imagery. That's, that's juxtaposition. Uh, we then get a bit of observation, deduction. Um, yeah, the, the phrase, they paid Smith well to hold his tongue. This again backs up the idea that the poor are mostly motivated by money. Think back to the Baker Street regulars, their shilling. Think back to Mordecai Smith's son, his shilling. The poor, their main motivation is money. Okay. And then we actually got on to the next page, didn't we? Let's cover anything here. So again, cover of darkness. That links with the idea that nighttime is mysterious. It also links with evil, villainy, um, death. You know, this is the dark in the light, dark imagery. And then uh, Holmes deduces that they're probably going to flee to the new world. They're going to go to America or some of the other colonies. Okay, let's just continue. But the launch, they could not have taken that to their lodgings. Quite so. I argued that the launch must be no great way off, in spite of its invisibility. I then put myself in the place of Small, and looked at it as a man of his capacity would. He would probably consider that to send back the launch, or to keep it at a wharf, would make pursuit easy if the police did happen to get on his track. How, then, could he conceal the launch, and yet have her at hand when he wanted? I wonder what I should do myself if I were in his shoes. I could only think of one way of doing it. I might land the launch over to some boat builder or repairer with directions to make a trifling change in her. She would then be removed to his shed or yard and so be effectually concealed, while at the same time I could have her at a few hours' notice. That seems simple enough. It is just these very simple things which are extremely liable to be overlooked. However, I determined to act on the idea. I started at once in his harmless seaman's rig and inquired at all the yards down the river. I drew blank at fifteen, but at the sixteenth, Jacobson's, I learned that the Aurora had been handed over to them two days ago by a wooden-legged man with some trivial directions as to her rudder. There ain't naught amiss with her rudder, said the foreman. There she lies with her red streaks. At that moment, who should come down but Mordecai Smith, the missing owner? He was rather the worse for liquor. I should not, of course, have known him. But he bellowed out his name and the name of his launch. Let's stop there. So here we have more deduction, observation. Um, he deduces 
that if they were going to plan to sail the way to the colonies, then the launch, the boat, must be pretty close. Because you can't have it really far away and be able to get away at the moment's notice. Holmes then uses some criminological methods, trying to put himself in the place of Jonathan Small, thinking about his capacity, you know, his, uh, his intelligence, his level of thought, which again, you know, I think is underestimating. And then this, I wondered what I should do myself if I were in his shoes. This is more deduction. He's, he's observed Jonathan Small's situation. He's stolen some treasure. He's got a boat close by. He's going to escape. He's trying to deduce what will Jonathan Small do next. And the best way to hide the boat is to take it into another boatyard for repairs. And say, you know, I just need this little job doing. Could you have a look at it? And then just leave it there. Don't think about it. That way you are separated from your boat. So if the boat gets caught, you're fine. Now this, this phrase here, it is just these very simple things which are extremely liable to be overlooked. Once more, Holmes sees everything. And this links to this quotation, this genius for minutiae. His ability to spot really, really tiny details. Um, and Holmes' theory, Holmes' observation and deduction, has been proved correct. He finds the aurora in Jacobson's yard and, yeah, he knows where it is now. He's ready to do the chase. More, a little bit on working class dialect, really, really simple. Now this, the fact that, that um, Mordecai Smith was rather worse for liquor. And this links with the question right at the top of the page. What are the attitudes towards the working classes? And, and I think this is a, a really good point to make. You know, Holmes and Watson drink all the time and Holmes uses drugs. This is what I was talking about before. However, they still judge Mordecai Smith for him drinking. Why? Well, it's class difference, isn't it? It's once more, it's the idea that the working classes are incapable of demonstrating moderation or controlling themselves, whereas the upper and middle classes are very good at moderation and can inject heroin and it not become an addiction or they can drink you know wine every single night and it not become an addiction now obviously in reality that's not true is it so so yeah so I should not of course I should not of course have known him but he bellowed out his name and the name of his launch. So let's just really quickly cover that before we move on. So this idea that the working class people are incapable of being subtle. He's clearly been given a, an instruction from Jonathan Small to not go around shouting out the name of the ship, to remain incognito, to remain hidden. But he finds that very difficult. OK. Um, let's continue now. So I want her tonight at eight o'clock said he. Eight o'clock sharp, mind, for I have two gentlemen who won't be kept waiting. They have eventually paid him well, for he was very flush of money, chucking shillings about to the men. I followed him some distance, but he subsided into an alehouse. So I went back to the yard, and happening to pick up one of my boys on the way, I stationed him as a sentry over the launch. He is to stand at water's edge and wave his handkerchief to us when they start. We should be lying off in the stream, and it will be a strange thing if we do not take men treasure in all. You have planned it all very neatly, whether they are the right men or not, said Jones. But if the affair were in my hands, I should have had a body of police in Jacobson's yard and arrested them when they came down, which would have never been. This man Small is a pretty shrewd fellow. He would send a scout on ahead, and if anything made him suspicious, lie snug for another week. But you might have stuck to Mordecai Smith, and so be led to their hiding place, said I. In that case, I should have wasted my day. I think that it is a hundred to one against Smith knowing where they live. As long as he has liquor and good pay, why should he ask questions? They send him messages what to do. No, I thought over every possible course, and this is the best. While this conversation had been proceeding, we had been shooting the long series of bridges, which spanned the Thames. As we passed the city, the last rays of the sun were gliding the cross upon the summit of St Paul's. It was twilight before we reached the tower. Okay, so then now, here's a handy little piece of exposition, just to cover some of this vocabulary. So exposition is how a story is told, is how a story progresses. And this, we may consider to be kind of a deus ex machina. This refers to the 
ghost in the machine? Is it God in the machine? <laughs> anyway, Deus Ex Machina is a convenient narrative detail that is revealed that helps the story to progress. Now, in this instance, the, the Deus Ex Machina is that Holmes is incredibly lucky to have arrived at Jacobson's when Mordecai Smith is at Jacobson's asking for the ship to be taken out. You know, if Holmes had gone to Jacobson's the day before, he would have missed it. He wouldn't have known the information. If he'd have been there maybe even 10 minutes late, he wouldn't have heard Mordecai Smith saying this. So this is a very lucky coincidence and a very convenient narrative device. You know, you, you all know it from films, you know, in a horror film when suddenly at the end someone reads in a book how to kill the monster. That's a deuce ex, deuce ex machina moment. You know, of all the books in all the houses that you could have picked up, to pick up the one book that has the, the way of killing the monster, that's deuce ex machina. Um, if someone comes in at the very last minute to save a hero, that's again, that's deuce ex machina. It's, it's just a coincidence, isn't it? Um, now, we get some attitude towards the poor. The idea that Mordecai Smith was very flush of money, he was chucking shillings about to the men. The idea that the poor are not good with money. The poor are overly generous when they are being paid very well. Um, and another little reference to drink. <clears throat> so, so the idea that, that Mordecai Smith went into an alehouse, even though he was really, really drunk, even though he should be working, he's just drinking and drinking and drinking. What's more ownership, my boys stationed him as a sentry, that, that he treats the Baker Street Irregulars like an army. We saw that already, you know, with the ranking system, where um, Wiggins is the top Baker Street Irregular, and people report uh, to him. Uh, and finally, on this section, Holmes has total confidence. It will be a strange thing if we do not take men, treasure, and all. Holmes has total, total confidence in the plan. He is still underestimating Jonathan Small, though even though he refers to him as a pretty shrewd fellow. Now, once more we get difference between Holmes and the police, Athelny Jones' plan would not lead to any arrests. Athelny Jones says that he would have police officers stationed at Jacobson's yard, uh, sorry, Jacobson's yard, that they would be there ready to arrest them all. And as Holmes says, Jonathan Small would send a scout ahead. You know, Holmes understands that Small has got some plans, and the, that Jonathan Small understands how to avoid detection. Um, so yeah, so then, so then, oh, sorry, I put uh, Athelny Jones there, but it should be Watson. Watson's deduction, again, is all wrong. Watson believes that if Holmes had followed Mordecai Smith, he would have arrived at Jonathan Small's hiding place. Now, as Holmes quite rightly points out, you know, there's no thing saying that Mordecai Smith knows where where uh, Jonathan Small and Tonga are hiding, and that if he'd stuck with him all day, he could have followed him around, not got anything. Because more attitude to working class, as long as he has liquor and good pay, why should he ask questions? Now, this talks about the morality of the working classes, that as long as you're paying them well and plying them with booze, why would they care about who they work for? Why would they care about the, that person's objectives? You know, it's, it's, it shows that the working classes have very little moral fibre when it comes to satisfying their more base urges. You know, the urge to consume or, or drink or flash the cash, all this kind of stuff. Okay. So, so then this is where the chase starts proper. So we've been shooting the long series of bridges. Again, this is a metaphor. This talks about the speed of the boat. The boat is shooting down the river, but it also foreshadows the violence that is going to occur. We then get the image of the last rays of the sun gliding the cross upon the summit of St. Paul's. So we have a couple of pieces of symbolism here. Sorry. My toe has covered up some of, the, some of the annotation there. So we have the symbolism that this is uh, all happening now at sunset. So remembering our light, dark imagery, lightness representing good, darkness representing bad. This is the goodness is setting. 
the badness is starting to take over. Night time is when the criminality comes out. Remember all the way back to Watson's description of London, the bars of light and dark and faces flitting between the two, people being both good and bad. Here we see the city of London, the good part of London, the London that we see after the death of Bartholomew Sholto with the sunrise. The sun is going down now, the darkness is taking over. So the dropping sunlight, definitely the start of evil, but at the same time, at the same time, there is the reference to the cross upon the summit of St. Paul's Cathedral. So a crucifix on a cathedral. This talks about Jesus, but it also talks about sacrifice. I can't read that word. I don't know what that word is. I'm so sorry. But, but definitely it is a piece of religious imagery. So we have the juxtaposition of the darkness setting in, the emergence of evil, the emergence of badness, against the crucifix, you know, a symbol of good and holiness. So that's, that's the duality of the city, the duality of the scene, that although there are bad things, there are also good things. Um, and I also talked to somebody once who discussed how Sherlock Holmes is essentially Jesus. But <laughs> that is a conversation for another day. Let's continue then. So, this is Jacobson's yard, said Holmes, pointing to a bristle of masts and rigging on the Surrey side. Cruise gently up and down here under the cover of this string of lighters. He took a pair of night glasses from his pocket and gazed some time at the shore. I see my sentry at his post, he remarked, but no sign of a handkerchief. Suppose we go downstream a short way and lie in wait for them said Jones eagerly. We were all eager by this time, even the policemen and stokers, who had a very vague idea of what was going forward. We have no right to take anything for granted, Holmes answered. It is certainly ten to one that they go downstream, but we cannot be certain. From this point we can see the entrance of the yard, and they can hardly see us. It will be a clear night and plenty of light. We must stay where we are. See how the folks swarm over yonder in the gaslight. They are coming from the work in the yard dirty looking rascals but i suppose every one has some little immortal spark concealed about him you would not think it to look at them there is no a priori probability about it a strange enigma is man someone calls him a soul concealed in an animal suggested uh, sorry someone calls him a soul concealed in an animal I suggested. Winwood Reed is good upon the subject, said Holmes. He remarks that while the individual man is an insoluble puzzle, in the aggregate he becomes a mathematical certainty. You can, for example, never foretell what any one man will do, but you can say with precision what an average number will be up to. Individuals vary, but percentages remain constant. So says the statistician. But do I see a handkerchief? Surely there is a white flutter over yonder. <gasps> Okay, let's just really go through some of this. So, we see that Holmes is ready for anything. He's brought his night glasses with him, his, his binoculars. Uh, Jones is still assuming things. Jones assumes that if they go downstream, then they'll be able to catch them coming out and follow them downstream. Just to clarify, downstream is the way that the river flows. Upstream will be sailing against the way that the river flows. It's more difficult to flow upstream Think about it as, as, as walking uphill or walking downhill. You know, walking downhill is a lot easier. So Jones is assuming that they're going to leave the boatyard and set sail downstream. However, if they did set sail upstream, then the police boat isn't going to be able to catch them because they're going to be behind them and also fighting against the current. Which Holmes says, you know, it's 10 to 1 they go downstream, but we cannot be certain. So Holmes here isn't prepared to gamble. Now more more attitudes towards the working classes. We've got to really fix that in our minds. This novel is a lot about attitudes towards the working classes. He talks about how the folks swarm over yonder in the gaslight. You know, they swarm once more like vermin, like um, a plague, that kind of thing. And then he refers to them as dirty looking rascals. So the idea that these working class men who've been labouring all day, Holmes doesn't appreciate them because they look dirty. 
But at the same time, Holmes recognises that in every one, they have some little immortal spark concealed about him. The idea that every working class man must have some good within them. You know, something about them that sets them aside. And that's more on the duality of character, isn't it? More on the duality of people. That your outward appearance can make you look like you've nothing to offer, but that inside you may have something. You may have this little spark. Um, this, just to, to clarify, uh, no a priori probability. Uh, a probability found through reason. There is no probability based in reason about it, about human beings, because there is nothing rational about human beings, really. We all have inside us our own desires, our own joys, our own hates, and they aren't based in rationalism. You know, they're based in feeling and emotion. And remember, you know, Holmes, Holmes struggles to recognise emotion and struggles to deal with emotion. So even in that case, Holmes isn't a rational human being because he doesn't fit with the, the general rule when it comes to people. This is a really nice, a really nice phrase to remember, particularly if you want to talk about the duality of, of the characters in this, this book. Someone calls him a soul concealed in an animal. This is the duality of man. So this is the idea that physically, you know, your physical desires are to behave in an animalistic way, to consume, to eat, to steal, to mate, to protect. All of these things. Uh, the animalistic side of us is the violent side of us. The soul side of us, and this is the morality, and... Within all of us, we all have a sense of what is right and wrong. And that sense of right and wrong is what stops us from giving in to the animal side of things all the time. To giving in to the idea that we want to steal or hurt or murder. You know, it is our soul that stops us from doing that. Uh, and the, it, Yeah. Then we get a little bit of structural symmetry. Remember in chapter one, Holmes advised Watson read a book, The Martyrdom of Man, by an author called Winwood Reed. Again, this is a novel that looks at man away from religion. It was a secular Bible that, that looked at all the different issues that, that, that people face, philosophically and spiritually. So, so... This is a nice piece of structural symmetry. This is Holmes going back to that novel that he uh, that he recommended to Watson. And then, while an individual man is an insoluble puzzle, in the aggregate he becomes a mathematical certainty. This is the idea that you can't predict what any individual would do, but you can predict what a group of people would do. And this is very much the case in school, you know. Like, we can predict kind of the overall grades for a year group but individually it becomes a lot more difficult and it also talks about the fact that individually a person will behave in their best interests but as a group then people will behave in the interests of the group uh, and do things that that work for the group okay now now i just want you to think about this question just before we move on how does this chapter oh dear one second. How does this chapter consider the duality of people? I'd like to go through sort of everything in this chapter and, and find more about that duality because when we get to the end, there's a really nice reference to the duality of people. Yes, it is your boy, I cried. I can see him plainly. And there is the aurora, exclaimed Holmes, and going like the devil. Full speed ahead, engineer. Make after that launch with the yellow light. By heaven, I shall never forgive myself if she proves to have the heels of us. She had slipped unseen through the yard entrance and passed behind two or three small craft so that she had fairly got her speed up before we saw her. Now she was flying down the stream, near into the shore, going at a tremendous rate. Jones looked gravely at her and shook his head. 
She's very fast, he said. I doubt if we shall catch her. We must catch her, cried Holmes between his teeth. Heap it on, Stokers. Make her do all she can. If we burn the boat, we must have them. We were fairly after her now. The furnaces roared and the powerful engines whizzed and clanked like a great metallic heart. Her sharp, steep prow cut through the river water and sent two rolling waves to right and to left of us. With every throb of the engines we sprang and quivered like a living thing. One great yellow lantern in our bows threw a long, flickering funnel of light in front of us. Right ahead, a dark blur upon the water showed where the aurora lay, and the swirl of white foam behind her spoke of the pace at which she was going. We flashed past barges, streams, merchant vessels, in and out, behind this one and round the other. Voices hailed us out of the darkness, but still the aurora thundered on, and still we followed close upon her track. Pile it on, men, pile it on, cried Holmes, looking down into the engine room, while the fierce glow from below beat upon his eager, aquiline face. Get every pound of steam you can. Let's just really quickly go through this. So then um, we have a nice contrasting use of religious imagery, you know, contrasting with the crucifix on the top of St. Paul's Cathedral, that the boat there is going like the devil, which also is an idiom to mean that it's going fast. We then have more symbolism behind yellow, you know, remembering that yellow represents gold, wealth, value. You know, on this boat, there is some gold, there is some wealth for Mary Morstan. Um, and, yeah, by heaven, another piece of juxtaposing imagery for religion there. Um, Jones, who is in doubt, doubts that we shall catch her. But Holmes, we must catch her. For Holmes, it is certain, it is imperative that they do catch her. Okay. We then have some nice description of the actual boat, you know, the police steamer. We have some onomatopoeia through roared and whizzed and clanked. Uh, a simile uh, that the engines were like a great metallic heart. The engines were what kept the boat alive. And through this onomatopoeia and this simile, Conan Doyle is showing the power of the boat. He's showing that it is like a living organism on the water. Um, then he talks about them on the boat. We sprang and quivered like a living thing. More, one great yellow lantern in our bows through a long flickering funnel of light in front of us. The idea that the light is piercing the darkness now. The light given off by the boat is showing the way, but also it's leading them towards their goal. We have a little bit of uh, sibilance here, the flickering funnel of light in front. This is fricative simile. And it's there to show heat, excitement, um, friction. All of those things are happening right now. Um, the aurora thundered on, which is a nice little metaphor to once more describe how the boat was moving, but also the sounds. You know, within all this onomatopoeia, please remember onomatopoeia is, is sense description. So you've got to talk about sense description. Uh, and the fierce glow from below beat upon his eager aquiline face so that the glow is lighting up homes and revealing this aquiline face aquiline means like an eagle so there we have another reference to homes as a bird you know, we've talked about homes as a hawk we've talked about homes um the actual shape of his face the beak his nose is being like a beak here again we have a reference to Holmes being like a bird. Please remember those because, again, if Holmes comes up, you could easily talk about how Holmes is compared to a bird. We talked about this before, but think about it in terms of prey, in terms of power, in terms of uh, being able to fly high in the air, his lofty ideals. All of that sort of stuff relates to Holmes being like a bird. Okay, four more pages. Um, I think we gain a little, said Jones, with his eyes on the aurora. I am sure of it, said I. We should be up with her in a very few minutes. At that moment, however, as our evil fate would have it, a tug with three barges in tow blundered in between us. It was only by putting our helm hard down that we avoided a collision, and before we could round them and recover our way, the aurora had gained a good two hundred yards. She was still, however, well in view, and the murky, uncertain twilight was setting into a clear, starlit night. Our boilers were strained to their utmost, and the frail shell vibrated and creaked with the fierce energy which was driving us along. 
We had shot through the pool, past the West India docks, down the long Deptford Reach and up again after rounding the Isle of Dogs. The dull blur in front of us resolved itself now clearly enough into the dainty aurora. Jones turned our searchlight upon her so that we could plainly see the figures upon her deck. One man sat by the stern with something black between his knees over which he stooped. Beside him lay a dark mass which looked like a newfoundland dog. The boy held the tiller while against the red glare of the furnace I could see Old Smith, stripped to the waist and shoveling coals for dear life. They may have had some doubt at first as to whether they were really pursuing them, but now as we followed every winding and turning which they took, there could be no sorry, there could no longer be any question about it. At Greenwich, we were about three hundred paces behind them. At Blackhall, we could not have been more than two hundred and fifty. I have coursed many creatures in many countries during my chequered career, but never did sport give me such a wild thrill as this mad flying manhunt down the Thames. So more difference between the Thelmy Jones and Watson, thinking, being sure, you know, simple. Um, the evil fate that circumstances was working against them. Uh, now this, we've gone from twilight, so do uh, sorry, dusk, to now we're in the middle of the night. This is showing the passage of time, the, the murky, uncertain twilight. Uncertain, maybe, referring to the fact that they may or may not catch the criminals. Um, okay. Uh, West India docks, this is a little foreshadowing of the colonialist ideas that are going to come forwards. Uh, and then we get more description of the aurora. And then think about how is this description mysterious? How is mystery developed there? We, we've shown that, that Jonathan Small has something black between his knees. No detail. Something that looked like a Newfoundland dog. Again, no detail. The red glare of the furnace. The use of the word red. There, the, the symbolism behind that. Danger. Anger violence, blood, all of that kind of stuff leads to the boat becoming even more mysterious. You bear in mind the police ship yellow is the colour that's associated with that, but this red. Uh, and now, now I of course many creatures in many countries, this shows that Watson has hunted many animals and he sees this very much as a hunt. Uh, and then this mad flying manhunt down the Thames, Watson is very very excited by this chase. Okay. So, uh, as I read this, just think a little about how is Jonathan Small presented as a dangerous savage. So steadily, we drew in upon them, yard by yard. In the silence of the night, we could hear the panting and clanking of their machinery. The man in the stern still crouched upon the deck, and his arms were moving as though he were busy, while every now and then he would look up and measure with a glance the distance which still separated us. Nearer we came and nearer. Jones yelled them to them to stop. We were not more than four boats' lengths behind them, both boats flying at a tremendous pace. It was a clear reach of the river, with barking level upon one side and the melancholy plumstead marshes on the other. At our hail, the men in the stern sprang up from the deck and shook. Sorry, at our hail, the man in the stern sprang up from the deck and shook his two clinched fists at us, cursing the while in a high, cracked voice. He was a good-sized, powerful man, and as he stood poising himself with legs astride. I could see that from the thigh downwards there was but a wooden stump upon the right side. At the sound of his strident, angry cries, there was movement in the huddled bundle upon the deck. It straightened itself into a little black man, the smallest I have ever seen, with a great misshapen head and a shock of tangled, dishevelled hair. Holmes had already drawn his revolver, and I whipped out mine at the sight of this savage, distorted creature. He was wrapped in some sort of dark ulster or blanket, which left only his face exposed, but that face was enough to give a man a sleepless night. Never have I seen features so deeply marked with all bestiality and cruelty. His small eyes glowed and burned with a sombre light, and his thick lips were writhed back from his teeth, which grinned and chattered at us with a half-animal fury. Okay, so, so let's just get to this. More description of the boat, more description of the onomatopoeia. Uh, and then we get our first description proper of Jonathan Small. This is our first sighting of him. He's shaking his clenched fists, cursing the while. Uh, he's very angry. Jonathan Small is an angry, angry person. A good-sized, powerful man. Um, in this way, maybe Jonathan Small juxtaposes Tonga. In the same way that Holmes and Watson juxtapose one another. You know, they, they are... in this, like Holmes and Watson, kind of a double act. So, so let's look at how Jonathan Small and Tonga are different. So Jonathan Small is big, 
powerful, angry, all that kind of stuff. We then get our description of Tonga. He's a little black man, the smallest I've ever seen. So Jonathan Small is big, Tonga is small. Um, Tango disheveled hair, you know, the thinking about here the, the general description of, of Tonga and what that all represents. So Tonga is savage, distorted. This links with the idea of Victorian fears. Remember, we've talked about Victorian fears of the colonies, Victorian fears of the other. Um, the face enough to give a man a sleepless night, deeply marked with bestiality and cruelty. Uh, so here's some animal imagery that he is like a beast. And his small eyes glowed and burned. His thick lips were writhed back from his teeth. All of this links with the idea that Tonga is savage. He is beastly. Um, and he, he chatted with a half-animal fury. Now think back to just a few pages ago. A soul concealed in an animal. What does this say is Conan Doyle's opinion of Tonga? If he believes that man is a soul concealed in an animal. If Tonga is outwardly showing all of his animal nature, do you think Conan Doyle believes that Tonga has a soul? You know, I'm not entirely sure. And if Conan Doyle doesn't believe that Tonga has a soul, then is that the case for all indigenous people? Is this a comment on the savage, in inverted commas, nature of people that weren't European? Maybe. Oh, and then think about this. Yeah, you know, if, if Tonga is described as an animal, and Conan Doyle believes men are a soul concealed in an animal, that shows that Doyle does not think that Tonga has a soul. Um, yeah, or, or at least, at least at the very least, it shows that Watson doesn't think that Tonga has a soul. Okay, sorry, let's go back to here. Fire if he raises his hand, said Holmes quietly. We were within a boat's length by this time, and almost within touch of our quarry. I can see the two of them now as they stood, the white man with his legs far apart, shrieking out curses, and the unhallowed dwarf with his hideous face and his strong yellow teeth gnashing at us in the light of our lantern. It was well that we had so clear a view of him. Even as we looked, he plucked out from under his covering a short round piece of wood like a school ruler and clapped it to his lips. Our pistols rang out together. He whirled round, threw up his arms, and with a kind of choking cough, fell sideways into the stream. I caught one glimpse of, the, of his venomous, menacing eyes amid the white swirl of the waters. At the same moment, the wooden-legged man threw himself upon the rudder and put it hard down so that his boat made straight in the, for the southern bank, while we shot past her stern, only clearing her by a few feet. We were round after her in an instant, but she was already nearly at the bank. It was a wild and desolate place where the moon glimmered upon a wide expanse of marshland with pools of stagnant water and beds of decaying vegetation. The launch, with a dull thud, ran upon the flush mud bank, sorry, ran upon the mud blank with her bow in the air and her stern flush with the water. The fugitive sprang out, but his stump instantly sank its whole length into the sodden soil. In vain he struggled and writhed. Not one step could he possibly take, either forwards or backwards. He yelled in impotent rage and kicked frantically into the mud with his other foot, but his struggles only bored his wooden pin the deeper into the sticky bank. Then we brought our launch alongside. He was so firmly anchored that it was only by throwing the end of a rope over his shoulders that we were able to haul him out and to drag him like some evil fish over our side. Let's just stop there a second. So, so... Again, we see this Eurocentric point of view regarding Tonga, the unhallowed dwarf. This is the idea that he's unholy or wicked. Uh, it links to the idea that he's not a Christian and he's not baptised, potentially. So, so he does not fit with that Eurocentric point of view that people should be baptised, they should be Christian, they should be christened. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and then more, more violent description of Tonga, more violent verbs. His yellow teeth gnashing at us in the light of the lantern. His hideous face. Um, more, and, and there, more symbolism behind the colour yellow. You know, the colour yellow features very prominently in this novel. Uh, our pistols rang out together, you know, Holmes and Watson, boom, boom, they're shots. Um, and then finally, the last we see of Tonga, he's venomous, you know, linking to the idea of snakes and poison, potentially the poison that he used to kill Bartholomew Sholto, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and menacing eyes amid the white swirl of the waters. 
We're then given the place where Jonathan Small is caught, and it links with death and decay, which foreshadows Jonathan Small's life. We'll find in the next couple of chapters that Jonathan Small's life is one that has been surrounded by death and decay. Um, the wild, desolate place, uh, pools of stagnant water, decaying vegetation. This is the place where Jonathan Small is caught. Uh, and then we are given some glimpse of Jonathan Small as he is caught. So Jonathan Small is struggling and writhing. He's not giving up. He's full of impotent rage. He's angry, but he cannot act. He's kicking frantically, struggling, but his struggling only pushes him deeper. You know, again, this is a metaphor for Jonathan Small's life. The more he struggles to get free of his problems or past or life, the more trouble he gets into. And as we see Jonathan Small's confession, that will become more apparent. He runs away from England to join the army in India, but that gets him in more trouble. So we'll see. Um, a nice simile here, like some evil fish. That's very easy to remember, you know. Uh, right. Okay, last page almost. The two smiths, father and son, sat sullenly in their lunch, but came aboard meekly. Enough when commanded. The Aurora herself was hauled off and made fast to our stern. A solid iron chest of Indian workmanship stood upon the deck. This, there could be no question, was the same that had contained the ill-omened treasure of the Sholtos. There was no key, but it was of considerable weight, so we transferred it carefully to our own little cabin. As we steamed slowly upstream again, we flashed our searchlight in every direction, but there was no sign of the islander. Somewhere in the dark ooze at the bottom of the Thames lie the bones of that strange visitor to our shores. See here, said Holmes, pointing to the wooden hatchway. We were hardly quick enough with our pistols. But sure enough, just behind where we had been standing, stuck one of those murderous darts which we knew so well. It must have whizzed between us at the instant that we fired. Holmes smiled at it and shrugged his shoulders in his easy fashion, but I confess that it turned me sick to think of the horrible death which had passed so close to us that night. Okay. So, so just finally, the idea that the the... The smiths came aboard meekly enough when commanded. This shows, again, the working classes do as they are told, particularly by people of the upper classes. Um, yeah, the ill-omened treasure here, that links to the idea that the treasure could be cursed. And when we get to the end of the novel, I would like to think about that. Is this that the treasure is cursed, or is this just the curse of greed? Certainly this talks about the, the emptiness of wealth, um, and that this particular wealth would only bring pain and misery to the people that uh, encountered it. More comments on the Victorian fear. Somewhere in the dock, ooze at the bottom of the Thames lie the bones of that strange visitor to our shores. You know, that the, somewhere in the Thames are, are Tonga's bones. Fi uh, more development of Victorian fear. The idea that they, were, they could have been shot with one of those murderous darts. Uh, more in terms of maybe personification, metaphorish, the murderous darts. Uh, and then we get finally the difference between Holmes and Watson. When faced with the potential of his own death, Holmes smiles and shrugs it off. It's not a problem. Watson turns him sick to think of the horrible death which had passed so close to us. Watson is scared, Holmes is confident. And that's more difference between Holmes and Watson. Now finally, before we finish, I'd like to spend some time working through this question. How is Tonga characterised in this chapter? Uh, and think, is it a fair representation of him? Save that last bit until we've looked at the very last chapter. Is it fair to say that Tonga is just a brute, savage animal that has no regard for human life? Okay, so that is chapter 10. Two more chapters to go, and then we're finished. Okay, I hope that you're all keeping well, and I will see you all soon.